From the National Football League to nationally acclaimed speaker and coach, but it's the journey in between those two titles that's really created the man, Marcus Ogden. After his time on the field, he lost his business, he lost his home, his car, his money. He became a janitor and then embarked on a gut-wrenching journey to build everything back up again and find the other side of success. There's a lot we can learn from Marcus and I'm honored to tell his story. This is Marcus Ogden, The Overcomer. Marcus. Yes. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I, I like to it. start with uh, a series of questions. I was about to say three. It's not three. I like to start with a series of questions. You ready for them? Uh, do I have a choice? <laughs> no. Okay. So let's fire away. <laughs> <laughs> when was the best time in your life? Hmm. When I got married. Yeah. I'm about to say, you know, we've been together now almost seven years of marriage together, 10. And, uh, I'm definitely a better man today than I was when I first met her. So I would say being married would be the, first, the best day of my life. I would say that for sure. Does she know that you answer that way? <laughs> oh, she will now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Conversely, when was the worst time in your life? Mm. The day my father passed away unexpectedly. I was, fit, excuse me, he was 57. And um, yeah, it just wasn't expected. I mean, we knew he had a heart condition. He had open heart surgery, made it through. Things were recovering and, you know, they get that call. It was probably about maybe mm, about 1.30, 1 1.45 in the morning. I was in Baltimore. I drove like a normal hour and a half. That took me about an hour to get there. And then he was pronounced, passed away at 3.15 or 3.16. I got there about 3.20. Oh. So I missed him by like four minutes. And yeah, that was for sure the worst day of my life, without a doubt. What came out, out of that for you? You know, it made me realize that life is short. I mean, my dad was only 57. So uh, I tried to live the life I am today for the fact that not, you don't know if tomorrow's promise. I mean, really don't. I mean, so I always tell my wife I love her every every night, even if we're mad at each other, which is not very often we're mad at each other anymore. But just do that. I'm always out of town. Text her, I have landed up to here. You know, little things like that, you know, just because you know, with my dad, I didn't get a chance to say I love you before he passed away. So I didn't, because remember fact, the last time I saw him, I was in his hospital bedroom, just checking on him, all that. And then he wanted to take a nap. He was tired. So I said, all right, I'll come back tomorrow. And I got to my car and said, man, I didn't tell him I love him. So I said, should I go back? Like, nah, I'll see him tomorrow. I'll just I'll see him tomorrow. That's what you always say. There was no tomorrow for that. I didn't see him tomorrow. So, you know, you have to really take each day, you know, and understand and cherish it because it's, it's not, it's not promised. How old were you when he passed? 25. Yeah. And where were you at that time, like in your life? I was playing in the NFL and it was hard. Um, you know, my brother also was playing in the NFL and he was, so I was 25, he was 31. So it was just hard on us, you know, cause he raised us, you know, by himself through the time I was eight, my brother was 14. So to have the guy, the person that raised you your entire, well, all your life, but especially the last few years of your life by himself, who sacrificed everything so you could have the best life. And he was gone early. It was just not expected. And it was really hard to deal with and come back from because, you know, we lost our support system. Do you feel like you still think about him a lot? Oh, all the time. All the time. I mean, my first tat my first ever tattoo was his nickname. His nickname was Tiny. That was my first ever tattoo that I got playing for the Ravens. I remember when I got it, he was like, What is this? I'm like, Dad, what do you mean? Like, this is honoring you. Is this, this is your nickname. He's like, oh, I don't like the tattoos, but this is me. So, okay, we're fine. Where is it? Can we see it? Yeah, it's right here. So, T-I-N-Y. That was the first one. Yeah, and then you've built everything around it? Yeah, it's, you can say I've added a few more since then. But um, that was. But my, most of my tattoos, I would say almost all were some sort of family or some sort of, you know, uh, you know, slogan or some sort of saying, you know, I had like a half here, Rome wasn't built in a day, which reminds me that in business and in life, it's not gonna happen overnight. You know, yeah. it's just not because anything worth having, you're gonna have to work for and put the effort in because if you don't, it's not gonna sustain itself. Right. When was your greatest moment of clarity in your life? <laughs> when I hit my rock bottom moment of clarity as a custodian working in downtown Raleigh, after I had lost everything. So when I moved to Raleigh in 2013, April, 
I had lost my business. I had lost my home. I had lost my cars. I had lost everything, money, credit cards, a lot of family, most of my friends. And I was basically at ground zero starting over again. And the moment of clarity came as a custodian and I was working the night shift, which I tell everybody it was a job and I needed the job in more ways than one. I needed the job financially, but I also needed the job to actually wake myself up. So it made me realize there was no accountability in my life, no responsibility in my life. And because of that, everything that happened in my life, all the shortcomings was my fault, mm. nobody else's. So when I had that, I call it my spoiled milk moment, when somebody's rotten meat, nasty protruding garbage, horrible spoiled milk over my body, my skin and my clothes, that was my moment of clarity. That was my, whoa, like, and basically, I think God was trying to tell me, hey, look, Marcus, you're here. Like, you're not going to be able to call anybody or wave a wand. This is not a movie. There's nobody coming to save you from this curb. You have two choices. One, you can sit here on this curb and play victim mode. And I saw mm -hmm. Marcellus White put something today on Instagram. It says, I'm from the hood, but I'm not from victimhood. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really great. Yeah. And, and that's where I was at victim mode. So no one cares, Marcus, about your <laughs> business failure. No one cares about you losing your money. You, No one cares. So you either stay here in victim mode, right here on this curb, live the life of always saying what you could have been mm. or what, worse yet, what you were. You mm. were an NFL athlete. You were a great athlete. And saying, oh, I could have been this or mm. I could have been that. Or you can get up and say, I can be this. I can do that and move forward. Yeah. We had Michael Strahan on our podcast a couple weeks ago. We published his episode, which was amazing. He told me his father said, it's not if you can do it, it's when. Mm. So for me, it was like, okay, when are you gonna get off this curb? Yeah. When are you gonna stop complaining? When are you gonna stop blaming other people? Yeah. And that's what it took. Yeah, you do have to get to the other side of it. You have to believe you have to get to the other side of it because some, so many people resign to it, get stuck in suffering. Right? Oh, yeah. They just get stuck there and say, this is this is my slog. I have a question for you. Why do you think that is? I, I do think victimhood is the is the thing. I think that's the 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 word that we just we don't want to embrace, but we almost feel like sometimes victim victimization can be like home base for us. Like I'm comfortable here. There's no one else that can help me. I think part of that too is fear, a fear of jumping out, a fear of going to the next thing. Mm -hmm. uh, because at least when you're suffering, you know what that is. Like, okay, I know, I know what this is. Yeah, it sucks, but I'm just going to stay here because anything else I do, I'll fail at. I think it's a fear of what if I succeed? Mm -hmm. What if I do get out? All right, what if I fail again? I'm still, I'm still afraid of failing again. So I think probably fear is the reason that that kind of en encapsulates us. It holds us down like a lid. How about this? It's easy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it could easy. be. It's easy. No, no, no. It's easy. It's easy to stay in that mode. It was easy for me between April 2013, September 2013 to say my partner's fault, the contractor's fault, the developer's fault, my employee's fault. It was always an easy out for me. Marcus, why are you here in a situation? What happened to all your businesses, your money? My partner, my employees, my, you know, the developer, the clients, everybody. It's just easy to say that. Mm. And then with that moment, I was like, wait a second, you need to take the hard road, which is looking in the mirror. Michael Jackson's great song, Man, <laughs> Man in, in the, the Mirror. mirror. <laughs> you gotta look at yourself. And yeah. I feel that's what was really missing from yeah. my life. It was that whole process of like, you need to take the hard road and stop blaming everybody else for your yeah. failures. Was that your turning point? Oh yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt, because if I didn't have that turning point, I don't know when I wake up or if I ever do. Because when I was doing football training, all that type of stuff, again, it was easy. I fell back into what I knew, coaching football and running seven on seven camps and doing, you know, being a small business person, you know, you know, just making 25, 30 K a year, just, you know, playing it safe. Mm -hmm. And when I had that wake up call, I said, I can do more than this, but are you willing to make the commitment to do it? And without that moment, I don't know if I would have gone gone forward. And what does that 
physically feel like for you? When you think about that moment, you think about the turning point, that that clarity, mm-hmm. where do you feel it? And can you describe what that feels like? Well, you feel it in your in your gut because it's like, it's a fear, it's a, a fear, it's a feeling of fear, anxiousness, stress. Uh, it's a feeling of, wow, what's gonna happen next? And so you have to make it okay to not be okay at times. Because again, just because you start something, this means it's going to work. Mm-hmm. So I started speaking in 2013, September. I didn't get a paid job for two and a half years. Yeah. yeah, tell me about that. Because I'm sure people said, this is not what you do. You do football, you do physical, your size, you're this, you're that, you're, you're all these things, right? And mm-hmm. people want to keep you in this in box, box almost, right? right? And so when you say, I want to I wanna speak, what was the yeah. initial reaction people were giving you? <laughs> Why are you doing that? You're never going to be the next Tony Robbins. What value do you have? What's your story? What's your action steps? Who are you? Why should we listen to you? I heard it all. And do you think that's fair that people said that to you? (sighs) Is it fair? No. Is it reality? Yeah. That's the reality, right? You're going to face adversity, no's, you know, the fear, the stress on your journey, especially if you're doing something that can be great. Mm. Oh, let's dig into that. Let's dig into that. Mm -hmm. So what was it that you were doing that was great? You know, what I was doing was I was owning the fact that I failed in life. Now everybody said, well, you don't, you don't fail. I mean, there's no failure. You learn all. And I, and I hear you, but let's just be real. I failed. It's, It's called what it is. When you go into chapter seven bankruptcy, lose your home, all your money, it is a failure. Now, doesn't mean you can't learn from the failure. That's on you, right? Are you gonna actually sit back and evaluate what happened? Are you gonna be real with yourself? Are you gonna look at, okay, let's talk about business. You're gonna look at the marketing of your business, the sales, the operations, the finances. Where did it fall wrong? And with me, it fell wrong with operation finances all day. I was great at marketing and sales, but operationally, I became egotistical, lost my best people, that started to crack, and then money. I put too much money into something, didn't get it back, crashed and burned. So you have to analyze things. And that's what I did, I analyzed the business. And what I realized was, when I said, I'm gonna become great at speaking, the minute I said, I wanna help people succeed where I failed Mm. in life, that's when things got better. Yeah, because you know what? What you're talking about is a demonstration of something I talk about. I talk about um, five truths of purpose. And one of those truths is that I believe purpose can only exist when it's about other people. Purpose sure, is sure. never about the ego. It's never about what can I do? What, can, what, what, what do I do? What do I bring? What makes me great? That's not purpose. Purpose is always from a place of service for other people. Sure. And so you were saying from your own journey, something that you know, where you failed, how can I help other people skip through that, right? How do I get them to the place that's, that helps them avoid the pain of it? Mm-hmm. But I almost wonder though, the pain helped hone you, mm-hmm. you know? So you could try to help people avoid those things, but if it's part of their path to, of overcoming self, how much do you think your words could even help them? Would it sway at all if that's part of someone else's path? Well, here's the thing, right? I know what you're saying, but here's what I'll challenge you is that yes, you can have degrees of being on the hard path. What you're hoping is that a coach will help to minimize those degrees of the road being hard or what you have to go through, right? I don't want anybody to ever go through what I went through not a client, not a person. I wouldn't wish chapter seven bankruptcy on my worst enemy. It was hell on earth. I had 177 creditors on my docket. I had over $5.5 million of debt. I owed $3,300 to my bankruptcy attorney to pay it to protect myself. It took me almost a year to pay that because I was so poor. Mm -hmm. I was literally doing football training. I would make, you know, say I make 500 bucks. I take $200 and go pay my bankruptcy attorney. The other dollars go towards bills, whatever the case Mm -hmm. may be. Make $1,000 running a camp for a weekend. Great. Take 500, go pay that attorney. 500 dollars go to bills. Like I didn't have money. I didn't have what I have today. So I had to piecemeal the bankruptcy 
payment to my attorney to get all those. So literally for a year and almost a half, I was exposed to any creditor that wanted to come after me from my business failure because mm. I couldn't protect myself. Yeah. So my point is, is that a great coach should be able to minimize your risk. You're going to always take calculated risk as an entrepreneur, an executive, because you didn't get there by playing it safe. But what you're hoping is that you are able to minimize and reduce those possible failures. Right. Because if I would have had a coach with my business, I would have said, hey, Marcus, I would have just hope a coach said, Marcus, why are you doing this extra work without a signed contract? What are you thinking? Like you've built this <laughs> massive company and you're going to put yourself on the line without a signed contract for this change would have worked? Why? Yeah. So that would have stopped me to say, oh, hold up, Turner. Hold up, hold up, Turner. I'm not doing this work without a signed change order. Yeah. But because I had no coach, right. my business partner, who was 41 years my elder, wasn't really as business savvy as I knew he needed to be. By the time we got into business, it was too late to know he wasn't the right for me, but we mm. were too far into the process. So he didn't help me to get that. I didn't really have the good guidance from someone to tell me, Marcus, this just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I gambled and I lost. Yeah. And so you wish, or not even you wish, I mean, you are going to be that person for other people. So there Correct. is true, like, it's not just, hey, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Maybe you should think twice about doing that. You've actually lived this path. And so yes. you're helping people of truly avoid those mistakes. Right. And I think, and I feel his, I think you can be a great coach no matter if you've gone through that or not. But I feel you can be a better coach. That's just my opinion if you've gone through it because you know what to look out for. Like I know what it looks like for business to start crumbling if you lose your best people, if you don't have a good marketing strategy, if you're not good at continuing to convert your sales, if you're overextending in your business financially. I know what it's like. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you will take my advice because again, like I tell my clients, you pay me so you don't end up like me. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good line. I I, I agree with you. It, it's interesting. It's not lost on me that you went from player to coach, certainly in a totally different realm. But let's go back to player, okay. Marcus. Let's let's talk about what athletes have to go to just to even get to that level of mastery in any sport. Certainly for you, you spent several years in the NFL. Mm -hmm. What do you think? is the perception of someone who ends up as a professional athlete like you? I think the perception is, is that we only have athletic ability and athletic prowess. That's not reality because just like anything, you have to be educated to be able to play a game between all the plays and the things you have to go through and the formations and a playbook and adjusting. Like you just don't go out there. This is not sandlot. You don't go out there and say, Hey guys, <laughs> Run fly pattern, run across, you know, you guys dive there. You don't just draw something up in the dirt when you're sitting there playing the NFL. You have a whole playbook. You have a whole scheme. You have a strategic plan to actually win the game. And you have a tactical plan of the plays you're going to call during the game. So it's not about going out there playing sandlot sports. It's about going out there and executing what the coaches and the coordinators call. There's a lot of thought in that. Mm. There's a lot of mental process in that. And you have to, it's kind of, it's just, think about it like this. You work in corporate America, right? Let's say you're working a job, you're working in your cubicle, you're doing your thing. Nobody has their eyes on you all the time, right? You can do your job, you can fly under the radar, you can, you know, relax at your office, you can watch, you can look at Meta, you can get <laughs> on Instagram, you're good, right? In the NFL, if you're on the field, you're, all eyes are on you. Yeah. You can't go high in a cubicle, <laughs> right? Fly under the radar. You can't fly under the radar. <laughs> like people, I mean, you're out there on that battlefield and if you screw up, oh yeah, they're going to see it. Yeah. And so people understand it's a very high intense pressure yeah. job. Right. And a lot of times you have to have a process in order to reach that next level of success. And people understand that that's what athletes go through. It's high stress, it's highly chaotic, and you have to perform under these type of situations, no matter what. Yeah. How you're feeling, what's going on in your, your household, 
what's going on with your finances, what's going on with your, if you're, you're a spouse, it doesn't matter. Because you know what? The owners don't care. The other team doesn't sure care. The fans don't care. Yeah. Right? They want to win. So it is a very high intense, high pressure situation job. Yeah. Do you feel like you had something to prove during those years? Oh, yeah. I mean, because being the younger brother of one of the best offensive linemen in NFL's history, you always want to prove that you belong in the NFL. You always want to prove that you're not just there because of your last name. You always want to prove that you can do the job at the highest level. Getting to the NFL is one thing. I mean, that's hard. Staying in the NFL is even harder because every year, new draft picks, new yeah. guys want your job. And that's what it is. It's a very, very small percentage of people that actually on the active roster dress play the people that want to get in, want to be on the football field, and you're always competing every single day. How did you, as a player, manage that competitive stress, but then also create relationships and that sort of team mentality at the same time. And how do you bring that forward now? So I, I had my brother to lean on, thank goodness, where I could talk with him about how to do that, like how to you know compete at the high level, then how to you know turn it off and be a teammate and have that camaraderie and have that bond with people that are on your team as you're, especially in training camp, as you're trying to earn a spot and you know get on the field and you're trying to win a job. And then I learned from my brother about how to turn it on and off and then Today, it's great because in our current business, you know, I have, you know, uh, one of my business partners, uh, of course, my wife is, is my main business partner. Then one of my business partners, uh, her name is Dawn. So then Dawn helps out with content creation and, you know, in process and blog writing and PowerPoints, all that. But then we have George who works with us with the website and SEO. Then we've got Donovan, who's our videographer, does all of our videos and stuff like that. Then we've got Albert, who's like our trademark and patent person. Then we've got Ben, who is our publicist and PR, our media. Then we've got Jamie, who's our bookkeeper. Tom is our accountant. And then Bob is our, our lawyer. And we work as a team. You like, just gave the whole roster and I love it. <laughs> because, it's, because that's everybody. Like, yeah. you know, that's the team. And yeah. like, and you talk about relationships, like I have to work hard because when we do branding meetings twice a month, you know, me, I'm on those calls. When we now meet with George once a month for website, then I have to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned is that as as our brand is gonna have me as the nucleus, right? I gotta make sure I, I'm working overtime. And that's what I learned in football because that's the, that's the whole process you have to have. You have to have Yeah, that's a seven day a week thing. I think people don't realize how many hours a day and days a week that professional athletes have. Um, you know, it might be 5 a.m., might be 6 a.m., all the way through to 7 p.m. that yep, night. And it's right. seven days a week. And I and I do think we have glamorized it so much as a society, um, almost like here are these people with this great physical strength. And, and to your point, I mean, I think we count out all the hard work that it takes to get there. We also count out um, that a person could have any other interests or any other abilities outside of that. And I know that's been part of your experience that people have really tried to keep you in this sort of shell where they've said, there's no way you can speak nope. outside of this. And no one wants to hear about anything but football. I'm sure people have said that to so, you too. So twofold. So I remember when I was coaching, I, went, I was coaching at a small university in Lillington, North Carolina called Campbell University. Got a huge law program, one double A program. I coached there uh, as an analyst, as an intern, kind of help out. The next year they offered me a job, uh, just working in the same capacity, but with small pay. And I was like, no, I'm good. I just didn't want to get into that realm. And I didn't want to, everybody said, well, Marcus, what are you doing? Like, you can go coach at Campbell and be a huge fish in little bitty little team, North Carolina. You can get paid 25,000 a year. You can get free you know, you know, healthcare, free, <laughs> free Waffle House for, uh, for life. I'm like, well, I don't want to be 500 pounds. I'm sorry, 375 in the NFL. I'm not going back there. I don't want to be a big fish in little bit, little bit North Carolina. Yeah. Like I wanted more than that, yeah. right? And so then I'll never forget, I was speaking, had a couple things going on, but it was kind of still early. And a guy that I knew since I was uh, 17, he played with my brother. He worked for an NFL team, reached out to him about speaking for his team to his rookies. I'll never forget his response. He said, Marcus, you know, I'm only taking this call because you're Jail's little brother, Jonathan's mm -hmm. little brother, and you have no value to me. You'll never speak 
ever. Oh. Um, you, I don't want washed up former players that don't have any type of you know name. I only hire the best. And if I were you, I would just seriously consider giving up speaking and never trying to do it again. Oh. And this is a guy that, oh. I, that I knew <laughs> since I was 17. And at the time I reached out to him, I was probably, let's say, two, 34. Yeah. So, you know, almost 17 years, right? Yeah. And I remember telling this to my wife and she was like, wow. How does someone even, I mean, like I'm thinking, how does someone even write those words? Like I would never think that or say, certainly never even say that to someone, you know? It's funny that you've known for 17 years. Yeah. And I remember my wife you know, reading that email and she got super mad. And I was just devastated. I was like, wow. Like if this guy who I've known can think about me in this capacity, what do others think? You know, maybe I don't, mm. maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I need to call and pack it in. Mm. So I took a, a 24 hours to think about it. And I called one of my mentors and said, Marcus, look, you're gonna face this on your journey, right? Understand that. Now, if you decide to do what he says and pack it in, he's one. If you decide to do what you know you can do and keep going forward, you have the chance to win. Yeah, yeah. Choice is yours. And so I took it, I went and, so now today we've worked for 37 Fortune 500 companies as a speaker. Wow. Of the 37, 13 are Fortune 100. We just got hired by Nestle to speak to them, their team next month. Yeah. And so we've worked for NFL teams. We've worked for player engagement. We've worked for universities. We've done commencement speeches. We have a podcast. Three, I'm yeah. a three-time best-selling author. All these things have happened since then. And that guy is no longer working for the NFL team. Oh, wow. No, he, he now works for NFL alumni, which is a group for a team, which is a, it's not even for a team. He works like an NFL alumni chapter, which is a much, it's yeah. a non-paid, much lower level type of job. Yeah. You know what? I feel like there's something too, when, when a person tries to only put others down, I know personally, like one of the things that I try endeavor to do is I try to look at everyone as a gift and I say, oh, you're, you're my gift today. And how can I be your gift today? You know, I, I don't, I know personally, I never want to be that person that just keeps someone from the success that, that is on their path. I'm like, cool, I'm, I'm in your path. Maybe I'm part of your path to success. So how can I help you get there? Um, I, I want to dig into something with you that, that you brought up that I, that I feel like it's important for people who listen or watch this podcast. Mm -hmm. You are on the other side of success, mm -hmm. but there were years where you were not on the other side you of success. Got that right. And so there are people who will listen to this, watch this, looking for encouragement, looking for support, mm -hmm. looking for almost like this feeling of community. Mm -hmm. And my goal is always to help people say, oh, that person in that chair, Marcus was there. I am there. How did Marcus in 2013 mm -hmm. as a janitor mm -hmm. turn it around and say, I trust what's inside. I trust what I feel I need to do. How did you turn that around to then now have this trajectory all these years later of success? Uh, the main thing people have to do is figure out what three things they do best. Society programs us to figure out what we don't do well. Well, we don't do this well. You don't do that well. You don't do that well. Every time I coach a client on the first call, every time, tell me your story. What three things are your biggest strengths? Ooh, do people struggle with that? I feel like people struggle to figure out what they do well. No, because really, people, no, because I I let them know ahead of time when we when we have our call because after every time that the client signs up, they get a welcome aboard email. On the first call, we're going to cover this, this, and this because I want them to be surprised. Yeah. Because the thing is, I want our clients to actually be excited about working with us and I want them to be excited about themselves, right? So what do you do well, right? Now I also ask you, what do you want to prove upon? Mm -hmm. But I start in the mindset of what you do well, because if people start off in the mindset of what they do well and then figure out, okay, what well, I want to prove upon, I feel they're in a much better position mentally to actually embark on the journey. And so people that are listening, what three things do you do best? So for me, I was a great communicator. I wanted to help people and I was a good storyteller. And so that's how I ended up starting the speaking business. I think you've left off one. You have an intensity. <laughs> yeah, you just do. Like you have this, 
this chip on your shoulder that gives you this crazy intensity where, yeah, I mean, I could tell you no, someone else could tell you no, but I get the sense from you, tell me if I'm wrong, I get the sense from you that you're just gonna, you're just gonna like go through that line. You know what I mean? Like oh, you're yeah. just gonna go. Well, I mean, you know what? You don't make it to the National Football League, you know, <laughs> not be able to have that attitude. Right. right. I was talking to a guy yesterday who was looking to sponsor our show, potentially. And this guy was like, and we had a conversation after our show, and he was talking to me about this, and I called him up a couple days later. We had a nice conversation. He told me to call him on Tuesday. Called him, didn't respond. Then we had a chat text. He said, oh, Marks, I want to wait for this. I said, okay, not a problem. I said, this, but this might be a good idea that we can embark upon. You have two businesses. We can maybe go this route, right? So the next day he texts me. He's like, well, Marcus, you know, I like your tenacity, but, you know, I didn't realize I was going to be trying to be upsold to on your podcast. So I politely just kind of myself. I said, you know what, sir? You know, we have 34 sponsors of our show since August. No one has ever been upsold to. I don't sell to anybody. <laughs> and you told me who you were looking for. And I told you that I could provide that. You said you want to sponsor for this amount. You said, let's have a call. You said, let's talk Tuesday. <laughs> so where did this whole thing come from? Like, I'm trying to upsell you. <laughs> so basically, I told him, you know what, Mel, I'm, 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 he's like, you know, well, how, I still, you still come up to Costa Rica and meet like my mentor and meet Gary V. I was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm good. Like, <laughs> I, I'm so good. Like, you can just go ahead and say, I don't want your sponsorship. I don't want to go meet your people because I don't want you to think I'm trying to take advantage of you. And I'm yeah. like, and my point is, is that when people try to tell me something, I'm like, hey, look, I'm not the guy to try to like, you know, get you want to do this with me. Yeah. Right? Either you do yeah. or you don't. Yeah. But that's the attitude I have to always now because of that guy, I'm just going to keep going more and more and more and more <laughs> with my podcast, with better guests, with more yeah. sponsors because yeah. I love people telling me, it's like, well, you think you're trying to do something? Well, no, no, no. Like, look, look. No, I'm doing not, me. Yeah. You're, 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 I don't like, you're not sponsored that I need. Like, you can take your money, yeah. you can stay right over there. I don't want to come to your event. You know? <laughs> and he called me. He's like, oh, you know, I want to pause. I said, okay, pause, accept it. Cool. You know, so you still want to come? Like, no, we're good. Yeah. Like, do people good. get one chance with you? <laughs> it, or do it, they get more? It, no, it depends on how you come across. If you come across like he did, it's one and it's one and done. Yeah. You come across, you know, have a little bit of a disconnect, but you're kind about it and you're polite about it, then we can go from there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean What happens when you have clients that or actually, maybe I should ask this differently. Have you had a client that you go, oh, your baby Marcus, you need me. Like someone that you can see them, they're like heading down the path that you headed down. Have you yes. found that person yet? Oh yeah, of course. I've had clients like that. Yeah, and usually people's biggest problem is they're, they're impatient. Oh yeah. And I have that ingrained in a, like inability to be patient. Well, and here's the problem, right? If you're impatient, people on the other side can feel it. Like I told this guy out there, I said, man, look, you know, if it doesn't work for you, take as much time as you need. And he missed that. And he, when he comes to tomorrow, I missed that. I said, well, yeah, obviously you did miss that because I don't <laughs> need you to feel, I need you today. And so I'm like, look, you know, take as much time as you need. And I'm like, look, the problem with most people though, is that they want the sale today. Yeah. It's not going to happen. People have their own schedules. They have their own process. You try to push people too far, they're going to say, er, I don't want that. Yeah. So that's what I've learned is that a lot of my clients who are like me in that regard, right, is they struggle with patience mm. or they expect people to respond to them in a time frame that they want them to respond. Right. It doesn't happen that way. How do you encourage people, um, you know, who, again, might be in that former Marcus spot, right? The Marcus of however, almost 10 years ago. How would you encourage someone to, as it dealt with relationships, not necessarily romantic relationships, but yeah, partnerships, I can, I, I can friendships, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like how, how do we know who the right person to partner with? Who's the right person to God marry? Who's the right person to befriend and, and just, you know, do life with. I'll go off this old, I, I guess it's like a quote or a, a way, a, I don't think a myth, but it's like, it's like a quote, right? You want to be a farmer, not a hunter. You want to plant seeds, let them grow, right? Like my wife and I met on Match.com. That was 2012. We dated, went through all the ups and downs, right? But it was, it was planting. Married in 2015. We married now seven years in May, right? The people on my team now, I met Dawn on LinkedIn in 2017. 
planted seeds there, right? And then she ended up working with me, moved to Carolina in 2018. Here we are. Dawn helped me find George and this and I went on down the line. So be a farmer, not a hunter. Like you're not out there trying to shoot game on the safari. <laughs> you should be out there trying to plant seeds with people <laughs> to actually develop relationships. Because yeah. here's the thing, there's belief and then there's trust. Okay. Belief is the hope that you or someone else can accomplish a goal or an aspiration. Trust is full confidence that you or someone else can accomplish a goal or aspiration. Every first encounter in life is belief, right? Now, how do you turn belief into trust? Discipline, consistency, focus, the fortunes in the follow-up and having a great strategy. That's how you turn belief into trust. So when someone hires you, it's either a high belief, a high level of belief or a low barrier entry of trust. As you work with someone time and time again, it goes from low bearing belief of trust to high level. Yeah. So the thing is, you can't push the belief barometer up by trying to force. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't work that way. Yeah. Don't work that way in relationships. Don't work that way in business partnerships. Doesn't work that way in client acquisition. Yeah. Don't work that way in anything in life. Yeah. But the problem I tell people is they need to just, this is where you need to plant seeds here, 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 plant many, many seeds. Right. Don't try to plant one and sit there over top <laughs> of the tree, like grow, grow, grow. It's not going to work. You got to plant yeah. multiple seeds. Well, I feel like this is, this is knowledge and wisdom from experience because I know growing up, you did get things by pushing, pushing, pushing. I mean, athleticism isn't something that's like, here, honey, plant a seed, and maybe everything will turn out okay. I think as an athlete, or am I wrong? <laughs> I'm wrong? Think about it. All this. right, okay, let's hear it. I had to plant seeds of my own development. As I got better at football, people got easier to move. Okay. So it's like, it's planting inside of me. I couldn't rush Marcus in high school to become as good as Jonathan. Because my brother had great coaching in seventh and eighth grade. He was six nine in the eighth grade. Oh my God. So I didn't have that. <laughs> so there is a level of C planning to develop as an athlete. Now, when you're on the field, it's 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 what you talk about. Smash. Right. That's it's 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 Hulk Smash. Like that's what football <laughs> is. But to get to the point where you are good at it. You have to plant and let it develop. If you try to, and that's why people get burnt out. Like talk about, oh, my son is the best seven-year-old Pop Warner player. He's going to be an NFL athlete. I'm like, damn, the kid's not even <laughs> out, of, out of elementary school. Why are you talking about him being an NFL athlete? Like, you know, let him live a little bit. Let him play other sports. Let him do a music, let, let, do a, 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 an instrument. Let, let him do something. I mean, like, you know, yeah. don't push. And that's what happens is. So uh, we, we interviewed, uh, uh, his name is uh, uh, Kenyon Murray, his father, or sorry, that's his, his, Kenyon Murray's the dad. His son, Keegan Murray, is like the one of the top draft picks in NBA this year, right? Coming out of college, he's at Iowa. We interviewed him on our podcast. He said, you know, Marcus and Lev, that's my co-host's name, you know, I told our, we told our kids, twin boys, don't rush, you know? He be said, a kid? Yeah, be a kid. Like he said, they were, when they were young, they played basketball, they played baseball. He said they lettered in golf. They were into like, you know, plays. They uh, got into nonprofit work wow. and they never burn out. Yeah. He said they never burn out. He said that was something that he knew could happen if they, he tried to push, push yeah. basketball, camp, go to all American. All, I mean, like he didn't do any of that. And because of that, now Keegan is finishing up, you know, that, that NCAA term is coming up and he'll probably be for, for sure. He'll be a top five and say maybe the number one draft pick coming out of wow. uh, the NBA uh, college this year. Yeah. Because his dad, he planted seeds with them and let them go do golf, let them go do football, and let them go be baseball, basketball, and life, and you know, and other things, and not just sports. It wasn't just all basketball. So people need to take that mentality in life also. Like just plant multiple seeds and don't try to force things. Because when you try to force, that's when bad things happen. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. And and then too, if other people are involved, no one ever likes being told what to do. We all bristle. Some of us have shorter bristles. Some of us have more tolerance for it. I'm one of those that 
has very low tolerance for being told what to do. I'm like, wait, what'd you say? But I think it's also part of like being the youngest of three kids. Like I just got told what to do all the time. And sure, I'm like, mm -mm, sure. you're not my mom. <laughs> um, I, I'm interested in this because I, I have a few close friends who are former professional athletes. Uh -huh. And the thing that surprised me, almost like there's been this ubiquitous sort of understanding with each of them that they believe that people don't realize how much unhappiness exists in professional sports. Oh, yeah. Because outside looking in, you know, here I am, armchair quarterbacking right now and saying, oh, look, they've got everything. They're they're on the field. They're playing great. They've got the big contract and probably, you know, the house and all of the doodads that go along with great success. They must be so happy. They've got it all figured out. Mm -hmm. What level of unhappiness do you think exists, not just in professional sports, but in even through entrepreneurship of like that back and forth pull of someone saying, no, I need to do this because it will make me happy. But at the same time, I'm unhappy. Have you seen that? One of my clients who I think the world of, she's awesome. Her husband's great. She wants to get into mental health coaching and she has a marketing business, which does very well, but she hates it. Mm. She hates it. She says she hates going to bed and knowing she has to wake up the next day and deal with all the crap of the marketing business, the clients, the back mm -hmm. and forth, the wishy-washy, and that's paying her bills, yeah. right? Yeah. That happens to so many people. Athletes, the same thing, right? You know, you can make a ton of money, things could be great, but then you could have problems at home. You could have issues with finances, or I literally just saw something on Instagram, Steve Harvey was talking about where he at, well, at one point owed the IRS $22 million because wow. he was basically taking care of all his stuff. He was doing his tax documents. He gave a check to his accountant, but the accountant would take the money out of the account that matched the IRS payment, but never sent the check to the IRS. Oh. So for seven years, it built up. So he thought he was making it, he gave him the documents, thought he was making his payments, all that stuff, wow. but the account was pulling out the money that matched the amount he was having oh. to the IRS. Wow. Right? So imagine the kind of stress that Steve Harvey was under yeah. to take care of that. I mean, $22 million that you owe, owe the IRS. And you're, and you're doing it the right way. You hired somebody, yeah. did your tax forms, made your payment, and it wasn't done on your behalf. Right. Correctly. Oof, that's stressful. So, and that's what I'm saying. And that's what people don't understand. Business is stressful. Sports is stressful. Because again, you're in a high pressure, high chaotic environment all day. I mean, I was watching something this morning at the, at the hotels. I was getting ready to get ready for the, come over here. You know, people who are in the trucking business, they're, they're just dying right now. Mm. Diesel is up over $5 oh, a gallon yeah, across terrible. the country. And a woman who was living in an apartment, right? And she had to get out of her apartment. She moved in with her, one of her, I guess, of her parents and they had to move out. She's now living in her, her truck. And mm. she said she's very nervous because she has to conserve gas because it's, it's more expensive. And truckers are saying, well, between the gas, the expenses, inflation, we're not making any money. Yeah. We're just paying our bills. So imagine how people who are just basically making money just to pay bills they don't have anything to put away. Right. It's, it's, I mean, it's just, it's, it's not good. So how do we get from, I mean, I think if anyone's listening to this and they say, okay, well, I'm, I'm in that spot. I'm doing something that I thought was going to make me happy, but now I'm not happy. What do we, what do we need to do? How do we begin to climb out of that hole to find uh, happiness or excitement or fulfillment? What would you suggest? So I tell people, I told this to my client yesterday, take two pieces of paper, write down your, I call them two lists. One is your happiness list and one is your reality list, right? <laughs> one, you, one is what you think what you want to do. Yeah. The other thing is things you got to do. And then what are the things you want to do? What are the things you need to do? Then from there, talk, take a third sheet and build your future list. Like, okay, I want to do this. I got to do this for now. I want to do this. Mm -hmm. and I got to do this for now. That's what I did. So I was basically football, coaching, running camps. That was my reality list. The other side list was speaking, coaching, consulting, podcast, author. Like that was my wish list yeah. that I compiled. Okay. I'm going to do football training first. 
Because you know it, and people trust well, you with and, that. And, and, and I make money off of it. Yeah. And I, yeah. Got, and I live. I'll do speaking. Then I set camps. Then I set coaching. So I, I built a third list. Yeah. And I was just basically coming down the list. I checked off. So when I got my first paid speaking job, April 2016, checked off speaker. But I was still doing my, my football training. I was still doing my 707 camps. Then 2018 comes, I get my first coaching client. Yeah. Check, I checked yeah. off that list. Off that, off that, off my uh, com my combination list. I checked that off. Wow. So then, as I looked at my list in 2020, March, when I'm like, oh my God, the pandemic hits. Yeah. I Everything on my list I'm doing, speaking, right. coaching, consulting, author, po uh, podcast. You know, I'm not one podcast wouldn't yet, but all these things I'm doing, okay? So over here, this is now, now so my wish list has become my reality yeah. list. But that took you four years. Yeah. Nah, longer. Six. Wow. Six. So now, boom, here I am. So my my old reality list, coaching football, 707 camps, birthday clown at birthday parties <laughs> for kids playing football. Oh, oh, wow. I would go out there with my birthday clown outfit on and play football with the kids. Oh, my God. That was part of my reality list at the time. That's right. A big six foot six guy out there with the, with the clown outfit on playing football with the kids. How did you find an outfit that big? I'm just curious. Well, my wife had a thing for Amazon. So, you know, you imagine you can find Santa outfits, so you can find clown outfits, you can just, you know, you can find all kinds of stuff. So I just had and my little little bozo the clown hair and went out there and did that. Oh my gosh. And I I got paid one twenty five an hour to play birthday clown and with kids. So all of my reality lists, that's what I did then. Two thousand twenty March I said, Wow. My whole wish list and my old reality list, I don't have to do anything on reality, my old reality list. My new reality list was my wish list. So I stopped coaching in March 2020. Wow. And I haven't coached since. I think of you, and it's the title obviously of the podcast too, I think of you as the overcomer. I think of your personal story as just a, a, a list of things over and over and over again that you've overcome. Mm -hmm. um, I do think because sitting across from you and hearing your stories and, and just even hearing your personal journey, I feel like there has been things, have been rather, that you've had to overcome. I also think there have been things that have like forced this chip on your shoulder mm -hmm. that make you feel like, you know, you have to prove yourself day in and day out. Mm -hmm. Do you, first of all, do you feel like you still have to prove yourself right now? Always. Okay. And do you think there will ever be a point where you don't have that same feeling like today I've got to fight today I've got to fight tomorrow I'm gonna to fight and then the next week I'm gonna fight does, right. does a world exist where Marcus Ogden doesn't fight every day no and I'll tell you why Marcus Ogden thought he didn't have to fight with Caden and what happened there he lost it all he stopped fighting he stopped the urge to be the best he got lazy he got complacent he got arrogant he got self-centered, and worst of all, he got really egocentric and money hungry, and he stopped. Mm -hmm. And then three months later, he's out of business. Yeah. So to answer your question, no, <laughs> I'll never stop working. I'll never stop. I, mean, I go to the gym seven days a week. I mean, I was in the gym this morning, but it's a little rinky-dink, like, I mean, Hotel. Literally, yeah, Hotel literally, gym. they had <laughs> one cross-country machine, one small bike, one treadmill, <laughs> The heaviest weight they had in there was 25 pound dumbbells. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, You're like, these didn't come with 25 pound I'm, dumbbells. I'm like, what am I gonna do with those 25 pound dumbbells, right? <laughs> so I just increased my number of reps and I worked out this morning. I did that, did my core, my sit-ups. And you know, cause you could easily find an excuse to say, oh, I'm not gonna bother today. Like, yeah, yeah, they don't have anything here for me. Or you can be innovative. I read an article about, it's called your key. Have you ever heard of your like key? Mm -hmm. It's like it's a it's a far west it's a far east term like Asian Japanese like Asian Japanese Chinese term of it's your life force energy. So when your key is not blocked, it creates innovation. It creates happiness. You can harness it for good. When it's blocked, negativity, stress, self doubt takes over your body. So I program myself to let my key flow. Now you do that by removing mental barriers. You do that by surrounding yourself with positive thinkers. And you do that by knowing you're good enough. 
So in the gym this morning, I said, you know what? My key is always positive. I can say, you know what? They don't have crap in here. I'm just gonna go to go back to sleep for another hour. Or on the new or Marcus the way he is, you know what? I'm gonna get on that machine and do an hour of cardio. I'm gonna use those 25 pound dumbbells and do my shoulder press and my uh, my uh, my front extensions and my shoulder shrugs. I'll do my sit ups. I'll do my 800 core abs. I'm out. Yeah, that's, that's true. what I did. Yeah. So my point is, is that Marcus always feels he has to do more than anybody else. And I'll be real with you because this is a podcast. I'm gonna be real. There's very few African American speakers that are speaking on corporate level. There's just very, very few. Why is that? You know what? <sighs> like real answer. Don't like give me some polished answer. No, no. I is? mean, real, real answer is that we have to, just in general in society, we have to get better at allowing people to actually prove what they can bring to the table. Mm. And I think sometimes we as African Americans get frustrated, because I know the hell I sure was, mm. with not having opportunity. And then when we get an opportunity, sometimes, kind of, I screwed it up, we don't deliver. And then we get criticism, right? Which I was pissed off about it the first time I heard it. But then I look back and say, wow, that really helped me. That's what's on our side. I think corporate America needs to do a better job of looking yeah. and trying to give opportunity and trying to give people who don't look like them at times that chance. Yeah. Because now again, it's both sides. Like you know, they need to do better about giving us chances and we need to do better. If we do a good job, how do you keep doing it? And again, like you just said, you don't want to just say, oh, I did a great job. Where's, it, where's, where's the jobs coming from? <laughs> like, I don't sit around and say, well, I've worked for 37 Fortune 500 companies, 13 Fortune 100, and say, oh, gee, life was great. <laughs> uh, they're gonna keep calling me like, you know, like nothing else. You gotta keep being the farmer and you planting seeds. You gotta keep, there you go. Like, yeah. coming here doing this podcast, like, you know, who knows who's gonna watch this? You never know. Right. I could have said, you know, Laura, I really like you. You're awesome, but nah, I'm mm -hmm. good. I'm don't just gonna feel, stay. I don't, don't feel, feel like, like traveling. Yeah, I'm gonna actually. stay home. I'm gonna stay home and just you know with my family and yeah. just take it easy. Because actually, if I didn't, if I'm not here, would have been the first full day off for me in like I don't know how long. But again, oh. but that, <laughs> but I love it because that's just not who I am, right? <laughs> but I planned it this way. I knew I was coming. Yeah. But point is, though, it's like that's the type of demeanor you have to have. Yeah. So I feel it's a little bit of both. I feel we need to do better of continuing to press forward. And if you are, and you're doing a great job, keep doing it. Mm -hmm. You're doing great. But on the other side, corporate America, you have to start letting people in that don't look like you at times, right? Give yeah. them a chance and see what they can do, right? And then, and judge people off of three things I learned from a very accomplished, uh, she actually was a director of events for AXA Equitable. A great speaker does these three things great stage presence, great audience engagement, they educate their audience. I don't care if you're white, black, Asian, I don't care, it doesn't purple, matter. Purple, you could be doesn't purple. Doesn't matter, you could be Barney, <laughs> right? If you do those three things as a speaker and you can prove it time and time again, yeah. you'll be successful. Right. But again, the hardest part I think for us, cause again, I remember feeling like this when I was starting out, we just don't get the chance. Yeah. Oh, and then you start putting yourself in victimhood too. Like exactly. it's everybody else's fault that I'm not. I don't, and that's why. I, that's why. That's what I was feeling like. Like, yeah. Damn. Like you know, it's because I've got double tattoo sleeves. Because I'm you know, black. Is it because what is it? You know what I mean? And then I say, you know what, Marcus? If you keep thinking like this, you're never gonna get anywhere. Yeah. So what can you do? And then I just start going to my network and saying, Hey, I'm speaking, yeah. and I want to do this. And people that looked at me not for my color because I'm a good person. Right. And that's how I got my first non-pay corporate job. And then I took that, got a reference letter, did more, did more. And I've yeah. been told no, and that happens. But again, to work for 37 Fortune 500, mm. 500 brands in six years, yeah. that's not easy. I don't care what color you are. <laughs> so you got to have the mentality though to keep going. Yeah. What do you think your purpose is? <laughs> Uh, my wife says my purpose is to talk, but uh, that's what she says. <laughs> no, it's got to be something deeper than that. No, something well, that's deeper. what my wife says. Uh, <laughs> my purpose is to really just leave this earth a better place than what I got here. We're all going to pass away. That's just life. But what are you doing while you're here? What's your legacy? What's your meaning? And my purpose is to give people knowledge, 
information that I have accumulated, either what I've read, what I've lived through, and pass it on. What you do with the information, that's on you. Mm -hmm. I challenge every audience I speak to, every audience, are you willing to take this information to elevate? Are you willing to take this information to ascend? Are you ready to become a better leader by taking this information tomorrow? Are you ready to become somebody with a stronger mindset? It's always a challenge in mm -hmm. every speech I do. Then I give you the action steps to actually make that challenge become a solution through what I've given you as action steps to make that your reality. But I can't make you do it. Great leaders don't tell people where to go or show them. They take them. But I can't take you and pull your arm out of the socket <laughs> to come follow me. I can't do that. Yeah. I'm not going to jail for you. I can take your hand and kind of say, hey, here you go. I'm not going to force you and just drag you across the room. I can't do that because it's not me. That's just not who well, I am. And it's not successful long term either because then someone has to make the choice themselves Correct. to do that, to change. Correct. You just, you know, I'm there. For example, a great speaker, uh, Eric Thomas, really good speaker. has a lot more conferences, sports teams. Eric's a huge yeller, huge yeller. But he's also like, I think like 5'8". <laughs> he can get away with that. You know, me at almost 6'6", almost six, six, I can't just yell at the top of my lungs in a room. People are going to be like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? Yeah, what, what's his I can't, deal? I can't do that. So my point is, is that you have to figure out what works for you, right? And be, and this I'll tell your audience, don't be afraid to go against the grain. Don't be afraid to be a trailblazer or a trendsetter. Don't be a follower. Don't do what's called chasing momentum or like was taught in the stock market, chasing the bull. You know, don't do that. Be a trendsetter. Be a trailblazer. Be different. Yeah. It's okay to be different. Like, most speakers aren't 6'6", 285, 290 pounds, double tattoo sleeve, former <laughs> NFL athlete. That's, that's, they're not. Yeah. But I'm okay with that. Well, that's what makes you interesting, though. Right. That's why people want to hear what you have to say. Right. It's because of the pitfalls. Because you became a janitor. Right. Right? You had it all, lost it all, have it all again. That's right. why people want to hear your right. story. And I tell people, that's what you have to do. You have to be willing to step out of your comfort. Jonah Hill, the actor, has a great the comfort zone is where dreams go to die, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or another great saying people say is when you, when you have too many meetings, that's where ideas die. Yeah. You know, don't, you know, one of the things people have to do to have the courage to lead through change, make a decision and don't drag your feet. Don't drag your feet. So right now, if you're trying to figure out what to do next, when you figure out what your three things are, reverse engineer backwards, you make a decision, go with it. Don't drag your feet. If you fail, okay. Again, like I said earlier, do you learn from the failure or do you keep making the same mistake? Mm. That's the difference, right? I learn from my failure. I tell everybody, and this is what I, I, I have to say, when you lose everything, you learn to appreciate everything. Yeah. Marcus, thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> appreciate it. So what'd you think? Tell me in the comments below, like it, share it with someone who needs to hear it. I'm adding new videos all the time to help you reconnect with self and then prepare for purpose. And since you're here, I've gone ahead and linked my playlist, the episode Amplified. It gives shorter clips from each episode, still though very much power packed with encouragement. It's all right here. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.